So Amiri had written, uh, Lufkin, Texas, a woman called 911 reported that two males were trying to kick in her door. So more than a prowler, right? That would be a home invasion. Uh, an officer responded and searched the area before knocking on the woman's door. The woman charges through the door while yelling threats and pointing a pistol. She was shot and killed by the officer. And I have a more uh, formal news report on this as well. And then we'll take a look at the video. Uh, officials have identified the woman who was killed after an officer involved shooting in Lufkin uh, Wednesday evening. This would be last Wednesday, last week. The city of Lufkin said a police officer responded to a call about two men kicking an apartment door at the Great Oaks Apartments around 6 p.m. When an, a uniformed officer arrived and rang the doorbell, the officer scanned the area for suspects and a woman came out with a handgun. Typical journalist writing. So this is all <laughs> mixed up. The officer arrives on scene, gets out of her patrol car, scans the area, walks around a bit with her flashlight, then rings the doorbell. Then the woman comes out with a gun. The Texas Department of Public Safety has identified that woman as Alaya Anders, 26. According to officials, Anders was yelling and cursing while charging towards the officer. The officer then fired four shots as they retreated from Anders. Anders collapsed at the end of the staircase with the gun still within reach. That's an interesting note. Uh, the officer who's been identified as Lauren Nick, 23, also from Lufkin, called dispatch about the shooting. Once the gun was out of Anders' reach, Nick began treating Anders until paramedics arrived. She was taken to the hospital where she was pronounced dead. She was determined to be the person who made the original call to the police. Nick was not injured, but was placed on leave. The Texas Rangers is continuing to investigate in the shooting at the request of the Lufkin Police Department. So this is typical these days, the local department. Um, in an effort to avoid the perception of bias, uh, when one of their own officers is involved in the shooting, they'll bring in the state-level investigative agency to conduct the investigation of their officer shooting. This note about how um, Anders collapsed at the end of the staircase with the gun still within reach, why might that be relevant from a legal perspective? The gun still within reach. Well, for two reasons. Uh, it's possible that she was shot. One of the times she was shot was when she was on the ground. And that can be for a couple of reasons. It could be just a delayed response from the police officer firing the shots. That typically there's a uh, there's a six tenths or seven tenths of a second um, delay in response to a change in threat profile when you're in the process of discharging shots. Um, alternatively, um, the police officer may have fired a shot into her on the ground deliberately uh, because the gun was still within her reach. If the gun's still within reach, she's still prospectively a deadly force threat. The other reason they may have highlighted, and I'm sure the officials intentionally highlighted this, um, is that there may have been a delay in providing care by the officer after the shooting. Uh, and there may be an argument that that delay in care contributed to the death of Anders here. And then, of course, the argument would be, well, you can't provide care until you, you know, secure the scene. You can't secure the scene until you've removed the gun <clears throat> from within reach of the victim. You can't do that until you're sure the victim's not going to suddenly, you know, lunge for the gun and shoot you with it. So let's take a look at the first of these videos. Now, this is the body worn camera video from officer Nick. Uh, again, there, there's no gore here. Um, you, I believe you do hear the gunshots, but the you can't see much because she's using a very bright flashlight in a confined area. There's lots of lots of uh, bounce back of the light, um, so you don't have to worry about gore. But uh, but a woman is shot dead here, um, so be aware of that. If that makes you uncomfortable, this may not be the viewing for you. All right, here we go. It's only about a minute and a half, folks. Again, a minute and a half. This is how quick life turns to death in violent confrontations. This is how fast it happens. Anders, the victim in the shooting in this case, has one and a half minutes left to live at this point. Here we go.
by the way, uh, first of all, this video and the ring camera video will be in the, the blog post version of today's content. So if you'd like to access this original source video, I'll make that available to you. If you're a law self-defense member, you need to be a member to access that. Um, is this prudent flashlight use by the officer, right? Checking out the dark spots, the balconies. Sure, of course. That's unfortunate. Let's play the ring camera and then uh, we can come back if we need to. This is only 16 seconds. Basically, it comes from the ring of the doorbell to the shots being fired. And of course, the perspective is from the doorbell as opposed to the body worn camera image. All right, so I forgot there was profanity, folks. Sorry about that. And it would appear that uh, Officer Lauren Nick is, in fact, white from this image here, although they have her face blurred out. So what do we have here? We have a police officer called to the scene of a purported uh, home break-in event. People are kicking in the door, the caller reports. And the caller was the woman here who ended up being shot and killed by the police officer. Someone's trying to kick in my door. She calls 911, asks them to send a cop. They do. They send Lauren Nick, police officer Lauren Nick, gets out of her car, walks around the building, is using her flashlight to scan the area, walks past the apartment door to the next balcony, uses a flashlight to check that dark area, Steps up, rings the doorbell, steps back to create some distance between the door and herself. And the door opens. And we see the officer initiate conversation. Basically, she says, hey, hi. And a maniac comes out the door, screaming, cursing, pointing a gun at the officer. Now, it's important to keep in mind that in these kinds of dynamic use of force situations, it's possible for both parties to be legally correct in terms of their threat or use of deadly force. It's possible to make an argument that the homeowner here, the victim of the shooting, the person who called 911, that given what she knew, the circumstances she was in, that she had a reasonable perception of an imminent, unlawful, deadly force threat to her. That argument could be made. Uh, she's the innocent victim of an attempted home invasion. Uh, the threat is now apparently they're back. In fact, when, when the officer goes past the apartment door and uses a flashlight to check that last balcony and then comes back, that last balcony was probably the balcony of the caller here, of the victim of the shooting. So she sees the flashlight coming in through her, her balcony window sliding glass doors, whatever that is, and think thinks they're back. They're back. The bad guys are back. And that's why she comes out the door. So she believes there's an eminent threat. Home invasion would be an eminent deadly force threat. Um, there's no legal duty for her to retreat inside her apartment. Of course, coming outside of the apartment is a little more complicated, but this is Texas, and Texas is a hard stand-your-ground state. Now, hard stand your ground doesn't necessarily mean advancing into the threat. That's something different. And then, of course, we'd have to question whether or not her perceptions, even if she had a genuine good faith belief in the need to use deadly force and self-defense, to be waving this gun 
and whoever that was outside. We have to ask ourselves if that genuine good faith belief in the need to use deadly force and self-defense was objectively reasonable under the totality of the circumstances. And that's a tough one here, folks. That's a tough one. First of all, she's, she's not staying in her apartment. She's coming screaming out of the apartment to the fight. And anytime you're going to the fight, rather than the fight coming to you, it doesn't look much like self-defense anymore. Um, also, she called the cops. If you call the cops and they say they're sending somebody, would a reasonable person keep in mind that someone ringing their doorbell could well be the cop that you called for, that they said is on their way? Can you just assume that someone ringing your doorbell are the prospective home invaders that induced you to call the police in the first place? Does reasonableness require the application of your powers of reason to actual evidence to arrive at your use of force conclusions and decisions? What was the deadly force threat here? Did she see two men? No. I mean, there was a flashlight. She saw a flashlight. I think I think this the, the resident here, the victim of the shooting, had simply made a determination that this is what she was going to do. She was going to show those two prowlers, and she's not to be messed with. And she came charging out of that door, screaming, cursing, pointing a deadly weapon, maybe to drive the prowlers off. Maybe that's what she had in her mind. I doubt, I'm almost certain, she did not realize she was pointing a gun at a police officer. I mean, that wouldn't make any sense. So she probably thought she was doing the right thing. Now, I mean, her legal justification is sketchy on a number of elements here. Uh, but, <clears throat> I mean, just imagine, for example, that she had shot the officer and killed the officer and then been charged with an unlawful killing, with a manslaughter or a murder. Well, her legal defense would be self-defense, right? So certainly I could make the argument with a straight face. It wouldn't be the strongest argument for self-defense I've ever seen. But let, let's pretend it was robust. Does that mean the officer's in the wrong? Just because the resident here could have a viable legal justification of self-defense for her own use or threat of force? No, because they can both be in the right. So the resident, even if we were to assume she had a robust self-defense narrative herself, that doesn't mean the officer doesn't because we have to look at the officer's use of force from the officer's perspective, given the circumstances the officer was aware of. Primarily, that the officer is simply going about her lawful duties, rings a doorbell, steps back so as not to frighten whoever opens up the door by being too close proximity to the door, initiates a relaxed conversation, and almost instantly has a drawn pistol coming at her from feet away. Is that officer going to reasonably perceive that as an imminent threat of deadly force harm? Uh, of course she will. Did the officer do anything that would lose her the element of innocence? No. Was the threat imminent? Yes. Was it deadly force in nature? Yes. Does the officer have a duty to retreat? In Texas. No, Texas is a hard stand your ground state for her, just like it is for the resident here. And was the officers, with the officers, were presuming she genuinely feared deadly force harm. That's why she fired the shots. But was that subjective belief? Would it be objectively reasonable? Yeah, a real gun was really being pointed at her. She, she didn't make a unreasonable mistake of fact here. The resident didn't come out pointing a cell phone, for example, that she mistook for a gun. And then you might argue that her mistake was an unreasonable mistake. But there was an actual gun in play here. So <clears throat> I would suggest that it's really an open and shut case of self-defense for this police officer. Now, could there be room to argue kind of departmental type policies? I saw somebody in the comments on Twitter say, well, she didn't announce she was a police officer. Well, was she given the opportunity? to announce that she was a police officer? I mean, let's go back. I think she was in the process of announcing she was a police officer. 
but there's nothing that says she has to scream it the moment the door opens. She can take a breath and start the conversation. Let's listen to that little portion again here, right at the end, the last 10 seconds or so. Hey. 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 Is it like <laughs> and there's the gun right there. Pointed directly at the body worn camera, which it would seem here is positioned in the center of the chest of the police officer. She says, Hey, door opens. Is it like She says, hey, this is the... Hey. Is it like... Hey, this is the... I, you think the next words were going to be Lufkin Police Department? Happened in Lufkin, Texas. Did the resident provide any opportunity for the police officer to identify herself as a police officer? Or did we get right here? Now, the flashlight, you know, it's it's not terribly well lit there, but also flashlights are used as defensive tools, you know, in the sense that they're, they're quite bright, as you can see here. If you're looking into one of these flashlights, the, the experience is much like looking, in, it's just a wall of white. So you can't really see what's happening on the other side. Officers are trained to use flashlights in this manner. Could that, this use of the flashlight, could it have contributed to the resident's decision to jump out with a gun? Had a blinding effect on the resident? I, I, is that a rational uh, response to a flashlight? Are the home invaders trying to violate this apartment with flashlights? So unfortunately, I think the resident's response is just irrational, but in any case, from the police officer's perspective, she's just doing her legal duties, rings the doorbell, steps back, starts immediately to identify herself as a police officer, but before she has the opportunity to even finish the sentence, finish the, what, three words, four words, she has a gun pointed at her. 